This is a lecture about continual learning and catastrophic forgetting of deep neural networks. And what we'll talk about is we'll set up the context and initial approaches for this problem. We'll talk about various tasks that are commonly used to evaluate algorithms for continual learning. And then we'll talk about a couple algorithms themselves to get a flavor of what they can look like. All right, here's the context for continual learning. So we know that we've been able to build powerful uh, neural networks that can perform really well at image recognition tasks. And this enables us to do things. For example, uh, on this image on the left shows a drone which is uh, inspecting a power line. And one could train this drone using a standard neural network technology. And one could have an object detector like is shown on right. And we see the antennas, uh, serial numbers, it might direct, detect corrosion uh, and other things like this. And so, so far, this is the standard story in deep learning. Now, once we develop and deploy this object, then it's quite possible that another situation is going to rise. For example, maybe we'll want to deploy this, uh, this drone uh, in another country where the antennas look differently, or maybe the rust uh, in this other uh, context looks differently. And so what we would need to do is we would need to uh, teach this uh, existing neural network about these new classes that we want it to recognize. Now there are other examples where we'll want to have uh, continual learning here where we that is where we train a network to do something and then over the, uh, the lifespan of its existence it learns new things uh, in addition to the things that it was initially trained at. So another example might be with uh, autonomous vehicles. For example, suppose you're a company that's making a self-driving car and you have a vision technology. And so you can determine what you're seeing. You, you can do things like object detection and image segmentation and, and things of the like. And then you might notice that you have a failure mode, which is a particular corner case. For example, maybe you have left turns at night in the snow in a construction zone as a case where your method isn't working very well. Then it's very natural to try to acquire additional data in that case. Maybe you pay some people to label that data and then you want to take your neural network and teach it this new corner case. And one can envision additional other contexts for this, uh, for example, even in consumer products. For example, one could have a toy and one might want that toy to recognize uh, other toys, or maybe you might want that toy to recognize the owner of it and treat that person differently than other people. Uh, there are any sort of things that uh, uh, are situations where, where you want objects to continue learning after they were initially trained. So mathematically, uh, we might think to do the following. We might think well, to simply train on the new data. And to put this in some uh, you know, formal terms, let's say that we have some task A, and task A is the, the initial, say, classification decisions that a neural net is trained to make. So this was trained off of some data set D sub A. Then we have some additional new task that we want this net to, to do, and we'll call that task B, and it has data set DB. Now, when we were training the task, it, uh, when we were training task A, we might not have necessarily known about task B, and so the first thing we did was solve this minimization problem here, where we minimized over D sub A of the loss of a neural network with parameters theta. We did this minimization over theta, and we initialized theta randomly. Right? So then task B came along, and then we say, well, why don't we just train on task B? So then in this formulation, we would do the same minimization problem. We'd minimize the loss of our uh, neural network. Uh, we'd optimize again over this parameter theta. We would only use the new data uh, for task B. Uh, and then the point is that we would initialize with the solution to task A. Now, the problem with this is that uh, this typically doesn't work. Uh, in particular, we, we see an effect that, that we get good performance at task B, but then we get worse performance at task A, and sometimes quite poor performance at task A. 
So in a sense, what's happened is that the new learning has interfered with the old learning, uh, or we can call this something like catastrophic forgetting or catastrophic interference. Okay? This is a major issue because when we think about the, the power of deep learning technology, uh, then it's quite reasonable to want to teach uh, networks new things after they've already been trained. And if the only way to teach them new things uh, is to start over from scratch, then that seems like a relatively well, poor technology. Okay. So how could we mitigate forgetting? Well, we could do uh, just that. We could train from scratch uh, with the new data and the old data. Right? After all, if we just used the new data, then we would forget the old data. So let's just train with the new data and old data together. Right. So while this has the benefit of allowing for successful training, uh, in particular, we were already training classifiers, for example, with multiple classes. So adding one or two more classes to that is no big deal. Uh, but the drawbacks of this approach are, are manifold. Now, in many industrial strength applications, neural networks might take days or weeks to train. So if we want to take that drone that could detect serial numbers and rust on uh, power lines, and we wanted to then teach it one new type of antenna, uh, then we might need to wait days or weeks for every new thing that we want to teach it. And that could be an unacceptable delay in a business context. So additionally, another drawback is that uh, starting over from scratch could be a waste of power in compute. Right? After all, these trainings can be, you know, as we said, like days to weeks, which is a lot of time. That can be expensive. That can take a lot of electricity. Uh, and it just feels unnecessary to do it. Uh, there may be other concerns as well. For example, even if we are willing to wait the time and pay the cost of compute, then we might have difficulty obtaining the training data again. Right? This could happen for multiple reasons. Uh, for example, companies are generally reluctant to allow other people to see their training data. And so if they uh, contract out a service to train a neural net to do something, then they're probably not going to want to release the training data for that net. So additionally, there could be privacy concerns about the data, uh, or possibly the data could simply never have been permanently stored. For example, if you think about a human that goes around for years collecting a video feed of the world, right? the raw recording of what that human saw before is not stored anywhere exactly. And so if we're going to build uh, computer systems that mimic this behavior, it may be unreasonable to store the continuous video feed of, uh, that some network has uh, had access to. So another concern would be if we do need to do this compute to update our neural network, particularly from scratch, then odds are we're going to need access to GPUs, we're going to need access to the cloud, which means we'll also need a steady internet connection. It, there may be many applications where we actually want to deploy learning-based technology, which can additionally learn on the fly, and then uh, deploy this to an area of the world which does not have steady internet connectivity. And in that case, we really need to solve the forgetting problem so that these devices can uh, learn the additional new things in those environments without having to connect back to more serious compute. So philosophically, what this all hits at is, is potentially a major criticism of the, the framework of deep learning uh, as it is right now. One way of saying this is we know that humans can learn incrementally. So we know that this is a thing that is possible to do. And the fact that our current technology for deep nets is not as effective at this as humans means we have a long ways to go in uh, in improving our, our machine learning based technology. So let's say we don't want to train from scratch. You know, another possibility is to replay old training data along with new training data. So in this framework, we have a neural network that is trained and then we get new training data. Instead of starting over from scratch, 
we start over with the neural net that we have already, and then we allow it to see new data from the new task, but we just intersperse old data from the old task. And the idea here is that, yes, we will not uh, forget the old task as much because we keep reinforcing it along with the new task. And so those are the strengths, but the drawbacks of this are, again, it still requires storing the old data. And then as I want to teach a neural network more and more things, then the storage costs are going to grow uh, linearly with tasks. And conceivably, over the lifetime of, a, of an object, this could be a very large amount of data that would need to be stored. So ultimately, these, uh, the, the difficulty of uh, continual learning comes from this dilemma. Uh, this dilemma called the, the plasticity stability dilemma is as follows. Right? We have a system which has been learned to do a particular task. And it's learned a bunch of weights to do this. In a sense, we want the system to be plastic, meaning that the things can change and grow into uh, better representations and better performance. Uh, we want it to be plastic, and that allows us to learn new things. However, we also want it to be stable in that we don't want it to forget old things. And so the development of algorithms for catastrophic forgetting and for continual learning uh, is trying to balance plasticity versus stability. And in the algorithms that we'll see in the future, then there will be specific parameters which actually act as a quantification of this balance between plasticity and stability. Now, in this, uh, uh, in this video, a lot of what we're talking about, of what we're talking about, you can find in uh, several reviews that have been recently published, like these that are listed here. So let's start with evaluating uh, continual learning algorithms. So this is to say, suppose you present an algorithm for uh, continual learning, then what sorts of tasks could we give it so that we could evaluate how good it is? And so there's several such tasks that are common. And one such task is a data permutation task. And this goes as follows. So let's say that I have a series of tasks I want uh, my neural network classifier to do. Uh, and the first task is I want it to do MNIST classification. That is to say, I'm going to hand it an image of a handwritten digit, and I want it to output the number that that corresponds to. So that is to say, I have some image xi, and then I have some label or response yi, which is a, a class from 0 to 9. So the problem here is simple. Given an image xi, uh, predict yi. Now that's one task. Uh, the data permutation task is as follows. Now I'm going to consider an additional task where there's some image perturbation applied to all of these images. So I'm going to say fix an image perturbation p2. This is some particular uh, rearrangement of all of the pixels of the images. So then I want to train a network where the input to that net was these permuted images and the output is the, the same class as it was in the unpermuted case. Right, so here we can say, see for example, like this zero here under this same random permutation got turned into this, but this one got turned into this other uh, set of black and white pixels. Uh, and we could uh, conceivably have many tasks that are like this. Right, so one thing that's nice about this, um, this data permutation task is that all of these tasks are equally difficult if the, uh, for certain architectures uh, of classifiers. Now another uh, situation where we could evaluate the quality of a continual learning algorithm is through incremental class learning. Uh, and in this setting, one could learn a base task set, for example, just the digits 0 and 1, and then we could sequentially add additional classes, uh, like 2 and 3, 4 and 5, and so on. So this is similar to the example that we gave at the beginning of the lecture about the drone that might know certain types of rust and certain types of antennas, and then we want to teach it a new type of rust or a new type of antenna. That would be an incremental class learning problem. 
Now, a comment about these sorts of problems is that uh, there should be a possibility to do this uh, continual learning because there are shared features between the old tasks and the new tasks. And so it should be possible to leverage the fact that we've already learned decent representations and perhaps all we have to do is uh, learn a few combinations of those existing representations to predict new class membership. Now a final uh, or an additional uh, and very challenging context for uh, continual learning uh, is in the multimodal learning problem. And here an example of that could be you want to train a single neural network to both do image classification and audio classification. For example, you could hand into the same net uh, these images of birds, uh, or you could hand into the same net uh, certain like audio waveforms, and then we might want a classification decision to be made uh, based on either of those inputs. Now, this is a challenging problem because the features that are important will be very different between the images and the audio. Now let's talk about particular approaches for solving uh, continual learning. And this is definitely a field that is very much a, a work in progress, but there are uh, several types of uh, algorithms for it that have different flavors. So one flavor that is common is the idea of training the entire network over, uh, but with regularization so that it doesn't go too far from where it was before. So we can see this here in the uh, part A of this figure. Here there's some neural network that you know, for at task t minus one, it has some values. And then at some new task t, then it updates all of the values of all of the weights of this network. Well, but again, it tries to update them uh, in a small enough way to not disturb performance on the previous tasks. Now another strategy is uh, our dynamic architectures. And here the idea is for additional tasks, add additional neurons and then uh, learn uh, the corresponding additional weights. And that could be done in multiple ways. For example, in part B of this figure here, there are additional neurons that are added and uh, connections that are put in between those neurons and existing ones. Uh, but it may also be possible to identify some of the uh, existing weights that are malleable uh, and then uh, add neurons and then update the, new, the weights corresponding to the new neurons and existing uh, weights that were declared to be uh, malleable. And one can envision many other uh, alternatives as well. Now, uh, another approach for continual learning is more biologically inspired uh, and it could be called a, a complementary learning systems approach. And these approaches that we have some form of memory and replay so that the neural network, when it's learning new data, can replay uh, things like training data from before. And we'll talk about this uh, in a minute. Let's begin with regularization approaches. And again, here, the idea was that we want to update the network weights, but we want to penalize changes in a way to minimize forgetting. So we want to update the weights while getting good performance on the new task and not having performance slip that much on the old task. One such approach is the learning without forgetting algorithm. And let's set up the context for this. Let's consider a predictor, uh, which is going to be applied to multiple tasks. And it's going to have some parameters that are shared between tasks and then some parameters that are task specific. Now let's say we've trained this, uh, this uh, predictor uh, with some number of tasks so far and we introduce a new task. So with the new task, what this method will do, it will actually update all of the parameters. That includes the shared parameters, the new parameters, meaning the parameters specific to the new task, and old parameters, meaning parameters specific to all tasks. Then the goal is to update all of the parameters in a way that the, uh, the new task works well, but also the output of the old task on new data doesn't change too much with the new training. So what that um, means is as follows. Like 
we're going to start with uh, you know, a set of shared parameters that have already been initialized for some previous task. We're then given uh, task-specific parameters for this previous task, and we're given new training data. And so this is new training data that we have not seen before, and it only applies to the new task. All right, so at initialization, what we will do is we will compute the output of the old task on the new data. And so by the old task, we mean this neural network uh, with parameters, the, the, the shared parameters and the specific parameters to the previous problem. We're going to run it on new data, and then we're going to store it. So in a sense, we're taking a snapshot of the existing network. But since we're only going to use new data, we're taking that snapshot only over new data. Now, this approach is about regularization. So the idea is that we don't want our performance of the old task to change much. So we don't, and so we want like our output to give a value on of the old task very similar to why not. Okay? So we initialize this why not, and then we uh, randomly initialize uh, parameters for our new task. Okay? So at this point now, then we do an optimization problem. Where uh, normally what we would do if we were just training on the new task is we'd optimize the cross entropy loss of our predictor with our training data. Right? So here's the training data, here's the predictor, it has parameters uh, theta, uh, theta hat n right, from up here. And we would do this optimization, it would have the cross entropy loss if we're doing classification, for example. Uh, so then we want to uh, not forget uh, too much of what we learned before, so we're going to penalize loss uh, of the new network or excuse me, loss of the of the old task on uh, this computed data. Why not? Right. So here we're going to impose some modified cross entropy loss on this, and we're trying to say that even though we're going to update theta s, and in principle updating theta s updates uh, this predictor um, on the the old task, but we don't want that old task predictions to change by too much from where they were when we started training the new task. Now, the fact that this is a modified cross-entropy loss uh, is actually something called the knowledge distillation loss, and I'll refer you to the paper to, to see more details. But we additionally have this parameter here, this lambda naught. This is a parameter which quantifies a plasticity versus stability trade-off. So if this parameter is zero, then we have a system that's very plastic, because then we would be heavily prioritizing the new task. If this parameter uh, were infinity, then we would be uh, very stable. We would be saying we don't want this network to change at all on the old task. And so for various values in between, it will quantify this trade-off. Now there's one additional term in this uh, algorithm, uh, the, this regularization term, and this could, for example, uh, be weight decay on uh, all, of these, uh, all, all of these parameters. So when we say that this is a method based on regularization, what we're really referring to is the regularization of this first term here. This is the term that says that we want the new net to not differ from the old net. And the particular way in the learning without forgetting problem was that the output of the old task on new data shouldn't change too much under the new training. And so this algorithm uh, is important to note, it does not require seeing uh, old data. And that is because it evaluated the performance on the old task using new data, even though the new data uh, isn't from the same distribution as the old data. And so naturally, uh, this algorithm uh, will likely work better as the similarity between the new task and the old task, uh, if that similarity is relatively high. Another approach for that's a regularization based for uh, continual learning is something called elastic weight consolidation. And here uh, we're we're supposing we have a network that's like trained on task A, and then we want to train it on task B. So the idea is to identify weights that were important to A 
and then penalize updates to those weights more than weights that were not important to A. In a sense, we're saying what coefficients of the vector theta are actually important for A, and then the ones that are not, we have more freedom to play with. So we're going to update the parameters uh, theta of a neural network, and the goal is to try to stay in a low error region for A. After all, this was the whole point of uh, continual learning, is to learn A, and then as you learn B, to stay in a, in a state which has low error for A. In principle, uh, the hope is that we can change the parameters theta in a way that it allows for successful uh, performance for task B while not changing much uh, the parameters at all. And then hopefully uh, leaving the performance at A uh, relatively constant. The reason that we might be able to do that or we might suspect we're able to do that is if we're in a highly over-parameterized regime where we have uh, many, many parameters in the neural network, then it uh, generally is possible to to, to fit new tasks with relatively small modifications to the weights from an old task. So this, uh, this method is visualized as, as follows. So this uh, ellipse on the left is the set of neural network weights theta that correspond to low error for task A. So that means we train some neural network. Uh, maybe it started over here and then it did some gradient descent and then converged to this point, which was declared to be uh, the, the, best, uh, the best theta uh, for solving task A. If we had just solved um, task B, then we might similarly uh, have ended up at this point for task B. And these two points might be respectively the best points for each of these tasks, um, though there may be a multiple of those or an infinity of those in parameter space. Now, the goal is to update theta in a way that leaves you in this region of low error for task A, but also brings you to a region of low error in task B. And so this uh, elastic weight consolidation is a way of trying to find this point here, uh, as opposed to this point, which would illustrate the forgetting of task A. Now, the, the actual uh, process here is as follows. Uh, here, the, we know we're going to be training this net, so we're going to be minimizing the loss. Uh, and so then here, we're min our new loss, which we're minimizing, is like a, a standard loss on task B. If we only had this term here, then that would be this approach of just train on task B and ignore task A. So instead, what this approach is going to do is it's going to say, I want to make sure that my theta is near uh, the, the theta that was learned for task A. So if theta A star is the solution to task A, I want to penalize any deviation of theta from theta A. And I'm going to penalize this uh, using a quadratic. Now, the method specifically evaluates which uh, coefficients of theta are more important than others. And that is reflected in this term fi, which uh, is a diagonal entry of the Fisher information of the learned predictor evaluated at theta star a. Uh, so these different directions are weighted in different ways. That allows important, uh, important directions for task A to be treated differently than unimportant directions for task A. Uh, and then additionally, there's this parameter lambda, and that is again the parameter for the stability versus plasticity trade-off. If lambda was zero, then we'd be very plastic. If lambda was infinity, then we would be very stable. Now this fi, uh, mathematically, this is the expectation over the training data of the partial derivative with respect to theta i, so that's the ith coordinate of theta, uh, of log p theta of x, uh, uh, quantity squared. Right? So we'll remember that the neural network itself outputs like a logit or a probability 
for a particular theta uh, and for a particular image, it outputs uh, it outputs a probability, and so then we are trying to uh, compute uh, this this quantity. All right, and this uh, this approach is uh, is motivated by a, a Bayesian learning perspective. Is actually a, a, a derivation in the paper for uh, where where this term actually comes from from this Bayesian perspective. Now, how does this method perform? Well, let's uh, let's first look at what happens with a, with a plain uh, stochastic gradient descent, which is to say, when you train on new tasks, you just train on them and you don't do anything special for old tasks. So here, in this case, there are three tasks. These are uh, randomly permuted MNIST classification tasks, and so as we suspect, if we train on on one task like task A then performance uh, under you know, any reasonable method is going to rapidly jump up to uh, you know, almost uh, perfect classification performance. So then we're going to start training on task B. And what we see is that once we start training on task B, the performance on task B indeed shoots up and levels off to something near 100%. Uh, then we're going to train on task C and uh, and we see that performance uh, shoots up on task C. So with stochastic gradient descent, this, this plain algorithm, then for each of these, as I train on the new task, the performance of that task uh, saturates uh, near 100%. But what's interesting is the performance on all tasks. So once I start training on task B, my performance on task A actually dips. And then when I start training on task C, my performance on, ta uh, on task A dips even further. Similarly, when I train on task C, my performance for task B dips. So what this shows is the effect of catastrophic forgetting. If we just train on new tasks, we forget all tasks. We dropped from you know, around 100% accuracy to, in this case, you know, maybe 85% accuracy. Now, if we use the elastic weight consolidation algorithm instead, then uh, we see that as we train on task B and task C, the performance at task A stays relatively constant. Uh, and then same with once we train on task B, we get good performance there, and training on C leaves a good performance at task B. Now one could ask, you know, was the performance of elastic weight consolidation due to all of this fancy uh, Fisher information? and that uh, way of selecting which coefficients get updated. And so in order to explore this question, what the authors studied is like, uh, what if all of the, the coefficients of theta i were penalized equally? So this corresponds to this an L2 penalization on the perturbation of the weights theta from where they were before. Uh, and then we see that uh, Initially, that as we learn new tasks, the performance on task A actually stays relatively high. But then once we trained on B and went to C, then that performance tanks. And so this, uh, this idea of minimizing simply the L2 norm of the perturbed uh, parameters theta isn't something that's going to work for uh, continual learning. Right, so this is the data that uh, supports the idea that elastic weight consolidation uh, can, can allow for, uh, or for continual learning in certain contexts. Now, there are other approaches that, uh, that we said that involve dynamic architectures. Uh, one such approach is something called progressive neural networks. And here the idea is Maybe initially we have task one, and so we train just this network here. Right? So we train it to take input and give some output distribution. And then we add a new task, and so we're going to add uh, additional neurons at each layers. And then, so let's say here, uh, if we've trained this to do two tasks, and we're adding now a third task, we're gonna add these additional neurons at each layer. Uh, and then we're going to add this uh, output layer for this new additional task. 
we will add uh, lateral connections you know, that allow each layer of this you know, new network to depend on the, the, the representations that were learned from the previous tasks. Uh, and then we're going to not allow any modification to all of these weights that were learned before. And so here, the idea is that we're growing the neural network progressively for each task, but we're trying to leverage the fact that we have already done a lot of learning so far. Right? The way that's being leveraged is by believing that these representations that are at these intermediate layers are something that could be helpful, and so then we want to exploit them in getting our, our output at the new, uh, new task. Right? So this is a, you know, a, a, an example of a category of methods which can select to add neurons uh, for new tasks. And naturally, the, the drawback of such approaches is as you keep teaching it more and more, then you may need to have, have continually more and more uh, uh, neurons uh, at each of those steps, and so then you're going to have storage costs for your network uh, that grow over time. Uh, and given that networks have quite a bit of capacity with, you know, rel with relatively fixed but large sizes, then it may be unreasonable to expect a system that does continual learning to like continually grow in size. After all, with human brains, for example, the neurons don't continually get added throughout one's life. And, and that is not the mechanism that permits uh, lifelong learning for, for humans. Now, another type of approach is uh, something called generative replay. And this, uh, this idea is as follows. So the idea is to train a generative model to output synthetic data that follows the same distribution as training data. And then what it's going to do is it's going to replay the synthetic data along with new data. So this approach, what, what it's trying to do is approximate uh, the strategy of just interleaving old data with new data. But we'll remember that uh, we're not allowed to see old data and we don't want to store it exactly because we want to, uh, we might not be allowed to. Uh, or we might want to like more economically represent all of the features that are in it. Uh, and so, so the idea here is that we're going to train the ability to generate data that looks like the training data. So generative modeling is the, uh, the process of given a whole bunch of data, can you learn the distribution that it comes from in a way that allows you to sample from that distribution? So in a sense, this is trying to learn the distribution of training input data so that we can generate examples from it uh, uh, in order to replay for our neural network. So this approach uh, uh, involves training uh, two things. So one is the, the generator and one is the solver. Right? And the solver, uh, given, uh, let's say we're in a supervised learning context, so like given a and an image X, we're trying to predict uh, class Y that that image corresponds to. And so when we're training our generator, uh, what we do is we use uh, input from the current task, and then we use generated outputs from uh, the previously trained generator. And then we intermix these current uh, and replayed images, and that allows us to train our new generator. Similarly, in order to train our new, uh, so the new solver, uh, this, this, this box here, then we're going to take uh, input pairs from our current task, so input uh, signals and responses, uh, and then we're going to use our generator from before to generate synthetic data representing our training data and then synthetic responses to that. And then we're going to lump these together and then use that to train our new solver. So this approach, right, it's, it's, it's really trying to build a, an understanding of all of the data that it's seen so far uh, in order to have enough replay to not forget what it's learned already. This approach 
you know, takes uh, inspiration from human learning, and in particular, uh, these like complementary uh, learning systems. And here, the, the idea is that in, uh, in, in human brains, that there are, there are different parts that do different things. For example, the hippocampus is where episodic memory ha happens, and this involves very fast learning of potentially arbitrary information. So then in the neocortex, the, where more abstract reasoning happens and where generalization will occur, then this would have a slow learning and it would have highly structured information. Now, the idea is that the, the hippocampus or this, could replay these experiences over and over again uh, to the neocortex as needed in order for the neocortex to uh, build, to learn in its slow way, this, this structured information. So this approach of the generator and the solver, right? the generator is taking the role of the hippocampus here, and the solver is taking the role of the neocortex. So what, what we see is that there's a whole variety of algorithms for trying to deal with continual learning. But generally speaking, this is a very difficult problem, and it is very far from solved. So in this lecture, we didn't talk about like the, the relative performance of these and other methods on a variety of problems, but you can see the, the reviews uh, that were listed uh, before and are in the, the comments below. Uh, in those reviews, they have uh, performance comparisons of these methods. But what we see is that like, we are far from a system that really mimics human behavior. And with humans, we know that people can continually learn throughout the, the duration of their lifetime, uh, but the systems that we have uh, currently don't mimic that particularly well. And this is an exciting area for uh, solving one of the major challenges of deep learning.